Popol Vuh, the sacred book of the Maya, contains within its creation story a tale of the destruction of the first beings by a great flood. This flood differs from others in that it's not meant as a punishment, but rather a remedy for an earlier faulty creation of mankind. The Telescalon from central Mexico have a legend that tells of men in some parts of the world who had survived the deluge, been turned into monkeys, and then slowly recovered speech and reason. The flood myth of Michoacan, Mexico, says that when the flood waters began to rise, a man named Tespi entered into a great vessel, taking with him his wife, children, and diverse seeds and animals for repopulation. When the waters abated, the man sent out a bird, which then returned with a green bow in its beak, which indicated dry land. In the biblical pre-flood world of Noah, it is written that there was taboo interbreeding going on between the sons of God and mortal human women. The ancient rabbinic scholars believe that the term sons of God specifically referred to fallen angels and that this was in fact the teaching of the early church for several hundred years. The offspring of these fallen angels were called Nephilim, but much of these stories have been effectively suppressed for many centuries and in many cases completely banned from inclusion in later versions of the Bible. They have, however, been recently rediscovered, for example, in passages from the Book of Enoch. During the late Pleistocene, or ending of the last ice age, the global sea levels were at least 120 meters, around 400 feet lower than they are today, exposing much more area on the continents, uh, coastlines, and especially islands such as the Azores and the Atlantic. This map shows the coastlines during the antediluvian or pre-flood times when much of the ocean water was trapped as glaciers and most of Europe was under one to two miles of ice. Rapidly melting glaciers caused global sea levels to rise, which covered much of the then exposed and above water mid-Atlantic ridge around 11,500 years ago at the end of the Pleistocene and start of the Holocene, exactly when Plato said Atlantis was submerged. In the 19th century, Madame Blavatsky supported the idea of an Atlantic continent running through the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, claiming that the Mid-Atlantic Ridge itself is a remnant of Atlantis. Blavatsky says, and I quote, No more striking confirmation of our position could be given than the fact that the elevated ridge in the Atlantic Basin, 9,000 feet in height, which runs some 3,000 miles southward, from a point near the British Islands, first slopes toward South America, then shifts almost at a right angle to proceed in a southeasterly line towards the African coast once it runs on southward. This ridge is a remnant of an Atlantic continent. Blavatsky comments on Atlantis many times, far too many to accumulate here in this short presentation, but briefly she tells us that the large Atlantean continent did not sink all at once, but in four stages, the last small remnant of an island called Poseidonus submerging just under 12,000 years ago. And she says again, and I quote, an impenetrable veil of secrecy was thrown over the occult and religious mysteries taught after the submersion of the last remnant of the Atlantean race some 12,000 years ago. The famous island of Plato, of that name, was but of a fragment of this great continent. The last serious change occurred some 12,000 years ago, 
and was followed by the submersion of Plato's little Atlantic island, which he calls Atlantis, after its parent continent. Geography was part of the mysteries in the days of old. So that said, let us now reflect on this quote from Plato written about 2,500 years ago. And again, I quote, This power came forth out of the Atlantic Ocean, for in those days the Atlantic was navigable, and there was an island situated in front of the straits, which were by you called the Pillars of Hercules. The island was larger than Libya and Asia put together, and was the way to the other islands. From these you might pass to the whole of the opposite continent which surrounded the true ocean. For this sea, which is within the Straits of Hercules, is only a harbor, having a narrow entrance, but the other is a real sea, and the surrounding land may be most truly called a boundless continent. Now in this island of Atlantis, there was a great and wonderful empire which had rule over the whole island and several others, and over parts of the continent, and therefore the men of Atlantis had subjugated the parts of Libya within the columns of Hercules as far as Egypt and of Europe as far as Tyrania. This vast power gathered into one, endeavored to subdue at a blow our country and yours and the whole of the region within the Straits. And then, Solon, your country shone forth in the excellence of her virtue and strength among all mankind. She was preeminent in courage and military skill and was the leader of all the Hellenes. And when the rest fell off from her, being compelled to stand alone after having undergone the very extremity of danger, she defeated and triumphed over the invaders and preserved from slavery those who were not yet subjugated and generously liberated all the rest of us who dwell within the pillars. But afterwards, there occurred violent earthquakes and floods, and in a single day and night of misfortune, all your warlike men in a body sank into the earth, and the island of Atlantis in like manner disappeared in the depths of the sea. For which reason, the sea in those parts is impassable and impenetrable because there's a shoal of mud in the way, and this was caused by the subsidence of the island. The downstream entrance of the Tam Lod Cave in northern Thailand. This is just one of the many subterranean river and cave systems in Asia, and fortunately offers guided tours through these mysterious caverns. The Nam Lang River flows right through the caves, and a tranquil kayak ride gives one a chance to take in the amazing stalagmite formations which can be seen throughout. On bamboo rafts illuminated by lanterns, evidence of human habitation becomes apparent because in these caves and other caves nearby, ancient wooden coffins have been discovered uh, which are thousands of years old and I'll get into that in a separate video. As the tour pulls up to a gravelly beach, other parts of the cave can be explored on foot. There are many geologic formations sprouting out from the floor and ceiling and forming flowstone columns where stalactites and stalagmites grow together. After poking around for a bit, the tours return to the kayaks and follow the river out the opposite side of the cave. You are inside the Blue Grotto on Capri Island. This video has not been retouched. Inside the water is exactly as you see here, a crystalline blue with silver reflections and you feel as if you were suspended in the heavens. Available boat tours make this very feasible attraction if you're in Italy. Another magnificent European attraction, which is far less accessible however, is the Gopher Burger Limestone Cave located in southeast France. It has often been described as a cave killer because six people tragically lost their lives in their quest to explore the underground rivers, lakes, 
and labyrinth of giant caverns that are located here. The cave was named after Joseph Berger who discovered it in 1953. From 1953 to 1963 it was regarded as the deepest cave in the world but now it's ranked number 28 of the deepest caves in the world and only the fourth deepest cave in France. The canals run for hundreds of meters and have to be traversed via ropes on either side as some of the pools are deep enough uh, for full immersion. Some of the oldest cultures speak of civilizations inside of vast cavern cities deep within the bowels of the earth. According to many Buddhist and Hindu traditions, there are secret tunnel ways that connect to a subterranean paradise and this is often called Agartha. In India, this underground oasis is best known by its Sanskrit name Shambhala, which is thought to mean place of tranquility. There are mythologies throughout the entire world, from South America to the Arctic, which describe numerous entrances into these fabled inner kingdoms. Many of the occult organizations, famous esoteric authors, and secret societies concur with these myths and legends of subterranean inhabitants who are basically the remnants of ancient antediluvian civilizations which sought refuge inside of these hollow caverns deep within the earth. South Africa is renowned for its above ground beauty, but there are also fascinating mysteries for those who wish to explore underground. The Kango Caves are located in Western Cape Province of South Africa. They were discovered in 1780 by a local farmer and the weaving and winding tunnels have helped make these gigantic caverns one of their most famous landmarks. The caves are rich in rock art paintings, stone artifacts, and other cultural materials showing habitation in the caves going back at least 80,000 years. first official guide, Mr. Johnny Van Wassenaer, allegedly walked for 29 hours upright, trying to find the end of the caves in 1898. He is said to have calculated that he was 25 kilometers from the entrance and 275 uh, meters underground. His route apparently followed an underground river and so far they're finding more and more caves to support his story but for now it's largely considered a legend so where the caves actually end is still unknown the Skokjen cave system in Slovenia includes the highest cave hall in Europe it features a massive underground gorge with an amazing waterfall and a spectacular bridge which goes right over the gorge and looks like something out of the movie. and the river still remains on the surface at the cave entrance but it suddenly disappears underground where it continues its way through the underground caverns and it emerges on the surface again not far from the Adriatic coast but this is after flowing underground for at least 20 miles so it's really spectacular
entered on UNESCO's list of natural and cultural world heritage sites in 1986, these caves in Slovenia represent one of the largest underground canyons in the world. And for this reason, it has its own, it has a special unique ecosystem that developed uh, in these caves due to the particular microclimatic conditions. So I found this particularly fascinating since I've been researching uh, the possibility of subterranean habitation by humans. H.P. Lovecraft's short story, The Beast in the Cave, is set in Mammoth Cave. The plot involves a man on a tour of the caves who separates from his guide and becomes lost. His torch finally expires, leaving him hopeless of finding any way out alone in the pitch dark. He then hears strange sounding footsteps approaching. Thinking it's a lost mountain lion, he desperately throws a stone at the source of the sound. The beast is hit, crumbles on the floor, and the guide eventually finds a protagonist and together they examine the fallen creature with the guide's torchlight and the creature mutters its last breath, reveals its face, and they discover it's a pale, deformed human who actually had lived in the caves, you know, for years. Located in central Kentucky and covering well over 52,000 acres, the Mammoth Caves was established as a national park in 1941 and as a World Heritage Site in 1981. With a staggering 400 miles of surveyed passageways, Mammoth Cave is by far the world's longest known cave system, and that's twice, over twice as long as the second longest cave system in Mexico. Several sets of Native American remains have also been recovered from the Mammoth Cave. Many of these mummified remains indicate intentional pre-Columbian funerary practice. And another fascinating discovery was the remains. Our planet's final frontier, an inner world into what is currently the second deepest known pit in Mexico and the 11th deepest in the world. The temperature in the caves are low, vegetation grows thickly at the mouth, and the floor is covered with a thick layer of bat guanu on which millipedes, insects, snakes, and scorpions live. But this is not the only subterranean world in the region. In the year 2000, the Cave of Crystals was discovered by miners excavating a tunnel for a mine in Mexico. The main chamber contains some of the largest natural crystals ever found in any underground cave. The largest one uh, so far measuring, I think, 36 feet in length, uh, 13 feet in diameter, and over 55 tons. So just spectacular. These amazingly huge crystals became so large because of the extreme, extremely hot temperatures inside of the subterranean caves. Uh, it reaches a steamy 136 degrees Fahrenheit and this encourages microscopic crystals to form and you know rapidly grow much faster than we're used to seeing.
The Hopi Indians maintain that their ancestors did not arrive from the north, nor by boat, but instead climbed onto the surface from the underworld. was formed as a result of a great deluge which had drowned uh, the previous third world. So Hopi cosmology specifies that this canyon, the Grand Canyon, was the exact place from whence the Hopi emerged from their subterranean refuge after the flood had destroyed the previous age. that are said to be located on their land in the canyon. One of them is a very revered and honored in ceremony as the dwelling of an ancient parent race. And this sacred site is strictly off limits to all but the Hopi people themselves. The lore further claims that the Hopi were assisted by a, a ant people who, who lived in the inner world, in the caves and caverns, and they're described by some as being, I guess you'd say, a pale humanoids with thin limbs, slightly arched backs, and the Smithsonian Institute may have actually discovered artifacts inside some massive caverns with intricate passages, rooms, um, you know, including tables with hieroglyphics. And there was actually an article published in the Arizona Gazette on April 5th, 1909. And it states that the Grand Canyon was once home to a lost civilization that consisted of people of gigantic proportions so giants basically it also mentioned the discovery of an enormous underground citadel and this was discovered by an explorer named G.E. Kincaid who came upon it while rafting on the Colorado River the entrance to the city was at the end of a tunnel that allegedly stretched for almost a mile underground so could there still be civilizations that exist deep beneath the earth? If so, where are these entrances to these inner worlds and who lives there? Which races inhabit them? Just as Plato wrote about the mythical Atlantis, a continent which was said to be once located in the Atlantic, Herodotus wrote about the legendary Hyperborean continent, which he said once existed in the far north. Sneffeljokut is a 700,000 year old volcano with a glacier covering its summit in western Iceland. The mountain is one of the most famous sites of Iceland, primarily due to the journey of the center of the earth, uh, written by Jules Verne in 1864 in which the protagonists find the entrance to a passage leading to the inner earth. The main characters make their way through hazardous passages and survive the tortures of thirst to discover 88 miles down a vast sea. The protagonists construct a raft and sail across this mysterious subterranean ocean discovering a lost world of giant plants and prehistoric reptiles. Throughout, the character of the professor remains the model of a rational 19th century scientist as he tries to calculate how the subterranean lake came to be. Uh, he speculates the ocean 
had flowed down from the surface through a fissure which closed and some of the vapor had evaporated to cause clouds and storms. Some of the oldest cultures speak of civilizations inside of vast cavern cities within the bowels of the earth. Mythologies throughout the world, from South America to the Arctic, describe numerous entrances to these fabled inner kingdoms. Many occult organizations, esoteric authors, secret societies, they all concur with these myths and legends of subterranean inhabitants that are the remnants of antediluvian civilizations which sought refuge inside of these hollow caverns inside of the earth. Bal Gangadhar Tilak was a very important and revered spiritual and political leader of India from 1880 to 1920. He was also a mathematician, astronomer, historian, journalist, and philosopher. In his book, The Arctic Home in the Vedas, Tilak theorized that the North Pole was the original home of the legendary Aryans and that during the pre-glacial period, some relocated. In support of his theory, Tilak points to certain Vedic hymns, Avestic passages, Vedic chronology, and calendars, which all describe ancient Aryan migrations from the Arctic to Northern Europe and Asia, and later into India. According to Tilak, after the destruction of the original Arctic home, by the last ice age, survivors roamed the northern parts of Europe and Asia in search of lands that were suitable for new settlements. One needs only to examine the flash frozen carcasses of uh, mammoths found in the Arctic with still undigested semi-tropical vegetation in their stomach, which are plants that are no longer found in the Arctic. And you clearly can see that the climate changed very abruptly and uh, catastrophically. Dr. Hermann Oberth, who pioneered a rocket design for the German Reich and later for the American manned space launches, once cryptically stated, and I quote, We cannot take credit for our record advancement in certain scientific fields alone. We have been helped. When asked by whom, he replied, and again I quote, the people of other worlds. Werner von Braun was a famous German aerospace engineer and spacecraft architect credited with inventing the V-2 rocket for Nazi Germany and the Saturn V for the United States. He echoed similar knowledge of a Nordic looking extraterrestrial influence when he stated in 1959, and I quote, we find ourselves faced by powers which are far stronger than hitherto assumed, and whose base is at present unknown to us. More I cannot say at present. We are now engaged in entering into closer contact with those powers, and within six or nine months time it may be possible to speak with more precision on the matter. Just who were the people of other worlds? that both of these esteemed German scientists spoke of so nonchalantly. The medium Maria Orsic was leader of the German Vril Society. In pre-World War II Germany, the Sisters of Vril conducted research into psychic phenomenon, advanced propulsion technology, and this included saucer-shaped aircraft or UFOs, as they're still called by the media 70 years later. Their Vril Society, whose members included some who would later become notable members of the Nazi party, believed that many ancient civilizations owed their origins to refugees from Atlantis. They advanced the idea of a subterranean civilization ruled by an ancient parent race who had mastered a technology called Vril, and this breakaway civilization was said to have survived antediluvian cataclysms, which ended the Ice Age 
and they continue to thrive below the surface of the earth. While it is widely accepted that the Nazis were defeated with Germany's formal surrender in 1945, this is only partly true. The Nazi elite were able to covertly develop craft that were far in advance of anything possessed by the Allies and establish a secret subterranean base in Antarctica, uh, New Schwabenland. New Swabia, or New Schwabenland in German, is an area of Antarctica called Queen Maudland. It was explored by numerous German Antarctic expeditions and one in the late 1930s reportedly discovered ice-free areas with warm freshwater lakes and signs of growing vegetation right there in the middle of the barren ice. The Nazi party proceeded to covertly build a massive secret uh, subterranean base in the large hollow caverns which have naturally formed deep under the Antarctic ice. Uh, they continually shipped men, uh, resources, material to the South Pole throughout the war years. And in 1943, uh, the German Navy Grand Admiral Karl Donitz stated that the German submarine fleet is proud of having built for the Fuhrer in another part of the world a Shangri-La, an impregnable fortress. The media is largely controlled by the Rothschild banking dynasty, as everyone knows, and for the most part, they promoted a false narrative concerning the events of World War II. Hitler's body was never recovered, and that's why after the Allies claimed unconditional victory, U.S. Secretary of Defense James Forrestal sent a military force known as Operation High Jump to invade Antarctica. And this included Admiral Nimitz, Admiral Krusen, and Admiral Byrd. Over 4,500 military troops from the United States, Britain, and Australia consisting of three naval battle armadas departed from three separate locations in 1946 following the war. Admiral Byrd's command ship led the invasion. It consisted of the icebreaker Northwind, the catapult ship Pine Island, the destroyer Bronson, the aircraft carrier Philippine Sea, the U.S. submarine Senate, two support vessels Yankee and Merrick, two tankers Canisted and the Capican, the destroyer Henderson, and a float plane ship Karatek. So Byrd was given unlimited funding and a full eight months to complete this operation. According to numerous sources, including Admiral Byrd himself, but things did not go as planned and it was a very one-sided affair with the Antarctic Nazis victorious. Upon returning from a rather swift and I guess you could say a humiliating defeat by forces which were supposedly surrendered weeks after Hitler's supposed suicide, we have published interviews where Admiral Byrd stated clearly that it was now, and I quote, necessary for the United States to take defensive actions against enemy air fighters which come from the polar regions. So the United States military and intelligence were not in Antarctica for research or scientific experiments, but they were apparently trying to locate and destroy this immense underground facility that was constructed by the Germans before, during uh, the war, and continued after the war. And it was likely used to further uh, the research conducted by the Nazis and certain secret societies which were 
developing uh, advanced propulsion technology, um, advanced aircraft. And these were the same ones used to decimate the Allies in Antarctica. Saucer-shaped discs, far in advance of anything possessed by the US. Top secret maps obtained by the KGB, allegedly, and belonging to the Third Reich have been recently leaked on the internet, which, again, allegedly depict passages under the Antarctic ice which were used by these German U-boats to access these mysterious underground polar caverns. The possibility that the Earth contains massive underground caves, caverns, that it's hollow or at least partially hollow, that these regions are accessible through passages at the poles, and that ancient secret breakaway civilizations flourish within them, this has renewed people's interest in a subject that's still largely considered, by the media at least, to be very taboo. And polar expeditions and battles like Operation High Jump still remain classified. And it's just shrouded in secrecy for decades now. But scientific revelations are coming out, they validate the rumors, and these covert events and their implications are finally being exposed and um, the earth might actually have entire civilizations living underground that we the public now are just being made aware of. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm a formerly educated anthropologist and now author and I'd like to invite you to explore some fascinating mysteries with me which for the most part have eluded any serious consideration in mainstream academia. Species with amnesia, our forgotten history, and gods with amnesia, subterranean worlds of inner earth. I'd like to thank those of you who share my passion of ancient history, archeology, span and continue to support me in my work. So I appreciate it and all the encouragement. Thank you.